California. Love it or hate it, it's hard to deny the sheer power and influence the Golden State carries. It's far and away the largest U.S. state in terms of population, home to 39 million people, more than live in all of Canada. 13% of all Americans are Californians, and it boasts the sixth largest GDP on Earth, greater than the United Kingdom, France, Russia, or India. On top of that all, it's the most agriculturally productive state in the country, having a greater agricultural output than the next two states combined, and with Americans depending on the state for one-third of all their vegetables and two-thirds of all nuts and fruits. There's just one problem. The state's climate and geography shouldn't have allowed any of this to happen. The Golden State as we know it was largely built by a vast marvel of engineering, two enormous water systems, each covering a distance over 700 and 400 miles respectively, one that provides water for nearly 60% of the entire state's population, and another that irrigates half of all its crops. Hello and welcome to That Is Interesting, I'm your host Carter. Today, how one state took on its own geography and created the largest water transport system on earth and how the failures of that system today are putting the state at risk. To understand how influential California's vast canal and irrigation systems were to the settlement and development of the state, it's essential to understand how, at least in the US, urbanization has traditionally occurred, and why it did so differently in California and much of the western and southwestern US. Normally in the United States, cities have developed and prospered when they possess four traits. Relatively flat land, survivable weather, enough fresh water to support a large population, and a strategic or resource-rich location. Flat land and decent weather make living somewhere easy and comfortable. A strategic or resource-rich location creates industry and jobs, creating a reason to live there, but it's access to water that makes life there possible. In the eastern US, most major cities possess all or most of these four characteristics. Some cities have grown and prospered despite missing one or two of these four traits if another is particularly strong but in all cases, water remains the common denominator. At the end of the day, if you turn on the tap and nothing comes out, you simply cannot live there. In part due to its geographic advantages and in part due to the direction Britain colonized the country, the Eastern US saw its population boom much earlier than the West, which had a number of disadvantages, a mostly mountainous landscape that left limited flat land and made travel difficult, incredibly hot weather in places, and limited major rivers. Much of the west, especially the southern half, was occupied by vast deserts, and even in somewhat cooler coastal areas, fresh water was limited. For much of the country's history, even after the 1849 gold rush, California remained among the least populous states in the Union, despite being the third largest in area. However, beginning in the 1900s and increasing especially following the end of World War II, California's population began a steady climb. A booming post-war economy that saw many young veterans financially stable thanks to the GI Bill gave many Americans a real choice of where they could live. On top of that, the automobile was now a popular and widespread means of transport. Interstate highways connected east to west, and air travel made a cross-country move feel much easier and the distance between old home and new much shorter. Finally, with the creation and growth of air conditioning, living in a hot climate was totally possible and could actually be comfortable. With the economy and new technology allowing people to pick up and move pretty much wherever they wanted on a large scale, the warm sunbelt stretching from South Carolina to California saw massive and rapid development and population growth. California especially was a popular destination. When given the opportunity, many Americans wanted California's beaches, warm weather, lack of humidity, and beautiful scenery. Daily life could feel like a vacation. A house on a hill was no problem if you had a car, 100 degree weather was fine if you had an AC unit, everyone else was moving there too so you wouldn't feel alone and plenty of jobs and new industries were springing up left and right. As for water, they were managing, at least at first. In 1910, California had 1.48 million residents, less than Mississippi, and 20 other states in total. By 1920, that number had doubled. By 1950, they hit 10 million people and became the second most populous state in the entire country. Today, it's rare to find anyone from California whose family's been in the state for more than a generation or two. At the same time, the potential of the state to become an agricultural giant was beginning to be realized. California doesn't seem like the kind of place that would do well as an agricultural producer. It's hot weather, on top of the fact that most of the state is either mountains or desert, makes its agricultural potential easy to overlook. 
why should it do so much better than states like Kansas, Nebraska, or Iowa, which have so much more flat arable land, land that's almost entirely covered in farms? The answer is somewhat counterintuitive. It was because of California's hot weather that its agricultural industry did so well. In the Midwest and Great Plains, though so much of the land is perfect for farming, the cold winters shorten the growing season significantly. California, while hot, has far more stable weather, and with mild winters, a full year where crops can be grown. Instead of having to wait for the snow to melt, farmland that grew a more mild weather crop in the winters can be replaced in summers with a crop that does better in warmer temperatures. And because California gets so little rain, if water intake can be controlled through, say, irrigation, it gives the state the ability to grow nearly any specific type of crop by adding just the right amount of water. While the rainier states of the Midwest don't need as much irrigation, they also don't have anywhere near the range of crops available that California does, and are primarily focused on corn and wheat. California was also really the only state where the year-round warm weather and sparse rainfall overlapped with the existence of fertile arable land. The vast central valley stretching down the middle of the state was fed by a number of rivers formed by snowmelt from the tall Sierra Nevada mountain range which joined up into two large rivers, the Sacramento and San Joaquin, that met in the California Delta and made their way to the San Francisco Bay. Other small valleys like the Salinas and Santa Maria held similar agricultural potential. Many farmers came before the state's population explosion. They divided these fertile valleys into large tracts, often purchased or broken off from the vast ranchos that California was divided between during Spanish and Mexican rule. These farms have not been broken up significantly since then, allowing a number of families who got there early to dominate the Central Valley to this day, owning massive tracts of land and growing incredibly wealthy. In a dry state like California, water is a limited resource, and it uses a system of water rights that are essentially first come first served, called the Doctrine of Prior Appropriation. Because these vast farms, which use up a much greater share of water than cities or towns, were often around first, they tend to get priority. It's a delicate balance that California's government has tried to strike for much of its existence. People need drinking water, and the state needs it to sustain its population. But people also need food, and it's hard to downplay just how essential California is to feeding the United States, and the world at that. Central Valley farmers had been irrigating the land on their own, but there were a number of problems. Firstly, the valley naturally went through periods of drought and floods, which made it near impossible to grow year-round. In addition, the northern half of the valley, the Sacramento Valley, received more rainfall and snowmelt and sat in a much more lush climate. The southern half, the San Joaquin Valley, was far drier. In 1933, the federal government, namely the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, embarked on one of the boldest engineering projects of all time. The goal? Allow the Central Valley to grow crops year-round by storing its floodwaters and bringing water from the Sacramento Valley to the San Joaquin. It would require the construction of enormous dams, the flooding of entire valleys, and digging of hundreds of miles of canals. Its construction would span decades, requiring whole towns and historical sites to be lost, and completely change the state's landscape, environment, and the natural flow of its rivers. At the same time, in the midst of the Great Depression, it would provide countless jobs, generate significant hydro-powered electricity, and more than anything, would help feed millions of Americans. The Sacramento River starts in the mountains north of the valley. There, they built the Shasta Dam, creating a deep and wide reservoir, Lake Shasta, which by volume is the third largest lake in the state and 33rd in the country. In the mountains nearby, but in the watershed of the Klamath River, which flows out to the Pacific near the Oregon border, the Bureau constructed the Trinity Dam, from which they could control the flow of the Trinity River, sending around 90% of its water through tunnels under the mountains to another reservoir, Whiskeytown Lake, and from there to the Sacramento River. These three reservoirs held massive amounts of water from the rain-filled mountains of Northern California and completely captured the upper reaches of the Sacramento River, allowing floods to be controlled and water to then be sent wherever they wanted from there. It flowed south, following the course of the Sacramento, as well as a new canal, the Tahama Calusa Canal, which now irrigated the west side of the Sacramento Valley. Other reservoirs like Folsom Lake outside Sacramento further contained the valley's waters in the mountains. The Sacramento and San Joaquin naturally met at the California Delta, a large inland swamp to the east of the San Francisco Bay. Much of this northern California water was diverted to a new lake in the delta called the Clifton Court Forebay, 
A pumping plant brought water from the forebay up into the surrounding hills, where it could then flow gradually downhill, south through the San Joaquin Valley, where water naturally flows north. A storage facility, the San Luis Reservoir, sits about halfway down the canal in the hills. This opposite flowing canal, the Delta Mendota Canal, brought water from Northern California that had made its way to the Delta, all the way to the San Joaquin River at the town of Mendota, over a hundred miles south. A similarly reverse flowing canal, the Frank Kern Canal, got water from a dam in the Sierra Nevada on the San Joaquin River, over another hundred miles south to the Kern River in Bakersfield. The lower half of the San Joaquin had been especially dry, its water disconnected from the usual flows of the San Joaquin River, in part due to the draining of Tulare Lake, a massive natural lake in the valley by the cotton farming Boswell family. These are far from the only elements of the Central Valley Project, but I hope you get the general picture. Water from Northern California rivers was held in dams, diverted using canals, pumped up into hills to then flow downhill against their natural path in order to provide Northern California water to the farms of the drier San Joaquin Valley. The California State Water Project began around 30 years later, in the 60s, and was even more ambitious. While the Central Valley Project was focused on agriculture and created by the federal government, the State Water Project was focused primarily on providing water for people, though about 30% is used for agriculture, and was created by the state government, managed by the state's Department of Water Resources. It was implemented by Governor Pat Brown, and served a similar purpose to the Central Valley Project, providing water from wetter Northern California to drier Southern California, this time for cities instead of farms. California's four main urban areas are divided between the northern and southern halves of the state. Sacramento and the Bay Area anchored on San Francisco sit in Northern California, and Los Angeles and San Diego in Southern California. In the fast-growing cities of Southern California, already among the most populous in the country, access to fresh water was running out. It was already limited to begin with. Both cities were squeezed between the Pacific and the mountains of the coast ranges in small flat plains and valleys. Any rivers that flowed through them were small, starting in the mountains just outside of the city. Beyond the mountains in the city, options were limited. Deserts and mountains stretched for hundreds of miles before you could reach any other major rivers. With an already hot and dry climate, there simply wasn't enough water near the cities of Southern California to provide for a population that was already huge and only getting larger. The State Water Project was built as an incredibly ambitious solution to this problem. It would receive its water from the Feather River, a tributary of the Sacramento in the Sierra Nevada in Northern California. There, near the town of Oroville, they built the Oroville Dam, which at 770 feet or 235 meters, is the tallest dam in the entire United States and one of the tallest on Earth. In this new reservoir, Lake Oroville, the state could store and manage the Feather River's water. Each of these dams served a dual purpose. In addition to water storage, they could be used to produce hydroelectric power, helping provide not just water but electricity to the state's fast-growing population. Water from the lake was brought down the Feather and Sacramento rivers, then rerouted through the delta to the Clifton Court Forebay, the same water storage basin used by the Central Valley Project. From there, a canal called the California Aqueduct runs parallel to the Delta Mendota Canal, also using the San Luis Reservoir. It runs down the San Joaquin Valley, but instead of discharging into the San Joaquin River for use by farms like the Delta Mendota Canal, the California Aqueduct continues south, running alongside the edge of the valley. Eventually, it splits into three different branches, which bring drinking water to much of the drier southern part of the state. The coastal branch, ending at Lake Kachuma in Santa Barbara County, provides water to much of the central coast, including cities like Santa Barbara, through tunnels and pipes underneath the mountains. The main branch of the California Aqueduct continues south through the southern tip of the San Joaquin Valley, where it reaches the Tehachapi Mountains. It's pumped thousands of feet up and then 10 miles under the Tehachapis using the most powerful pumping plant on Earth, the Edmonston Pumping Plant. Just to get an idea of how much of a feat of engineering getting water across the Tehachapis is, this one plant alone uses 40% of all of the electricity needed to power the entire state water project. On the other side of the mountains, in the Mojave Desert's Antelope Valley, the California Aqueduct splits into the east and west branch. The west branch heads south to Castaic Lake north of Santa Clarita, and the east branch continues for hundreds of miles through the Mojave, crossing under the mountains and ending at Lake Paris near Moreno Valley, where it's stored along with Silverwood Lake further up the canal. These three storage lakes, Paris, Silverwood, and Castaic, provide water for much of the LA area and Southern California. 
If you go to Lake Paris, sitting south of San Bernardino, it's hard to fathom that its water comes from a river 500 miles to the north, having crossed valleys, deserts, through tunnels, and up mountainsides. While the Central Valley Project made California's dominance in agriculture possible, the State Water Project made its dominance in population possible, turning an area that could not support so many people into one of the largest population centers on Earth. In 1960, before the construction of the State Water Project, California was already the second most populous state in the country, home to 15.7 million people and just under New York, which was at 16.7. In the 60 years since, New York has grown by about 3.5 million people up to 20.2 million. Pennsylvania, which was just under California at 11.3 million people, added around 1.7 million, with 13 million residents today. California, on the other hand, tripled in population adding 23.8 million people to a total of 39.5 million. The State Water Project made this growth a possibility. Today though, the massive water transport system that made the state's agriculture and population possible in the first place is under extreme pressure. California's population has tripled. It's grown far too much for even this intricate water system to support. On top of that, because it's hot weather gives California a full year growing season, Water is constantly being used to irrigate its farms, and much of it is lost to evaporation. Southern California has essentially no cloud cover, and temperatures often reach into the 90s and 100s. Spray irrigation is commonly used, a system which is inefficient and loses 35% of all its water. This massive population, coupled with just how water-intensive agriculture in California is, has put severe strain on the state's water supply. It's brought in water from other sources as well. The Colorado River Aqueduct brings in water from Lake Havasu on the Colorado River and Lake Mead. The massive reservoir formed by the Hoover Dam is a major source of water for Southern California as well. But Lake Mead is drying up, as are much of the state's the Central Valley Project and State Water Project use as storage facilities. Many have reached record lows in recent years. On top of that, despite its politicization, the greenhouse effect is very real and the raising of global temperatures in recent decades has only made California's water problem far worse. From 2011 to 2017, the state suffered its longest drought in recorded history, and drought-like conditions are still prevalent in much of California. This has led to not only problems with water supply and agricultural production, but has contributed to near constant cycles of horrible wildfires. California's population is declining, plateauing really, but it's the first time ever that its population has been recorded as decreasing. Though there are other factors that are at play, the state's drought and increase in wildfires are certainly a part of the story. I'm sure there will be many comments about desalination, the conversion of salt water to fresh water, and it's certainly a compelling solution, but it's not some magic answer. They are incredibly expensive to build and to run, and don't produce nearly enough fresh water to completely solve the problem. In addition, California already has 12 desalination plants and is currently constructing 17 more, so it's not something that they haven't been using. This is obviously only a part of the story of how the US's most populous state harnessed and controlled its water, and there are many more fascinating stories to tell. I only briefly touched on the state's use of the Colorado River because it lies outside of the state water project, but the state is heavily reliant on it, and the fact that Lake Mead is drying up will continue to have severe repercussions for all the states that rely on its water. Owens Lake was a large natural lake in the Owens Valley east of the Sierra Nevada and hundreds of miles from Los Angeles. LA's early growth and success was largely due to it gaining access to the lake's water which drained the lake and desertified the valley, and the long-standing disputes between the locals of the Owens Valley and LA are known as the Water Wars. There's also the Hetch Hetchy Valley, a spectacular canyon in the Sierra Nevada said to rival Yosemite that was dammed and filled to provide drinking water for San Francisco. I've already made videos on the accidental creation of the Salton Sea due to a ruptured canal and the draining of Tulare Lake, the largest freshwater lake east of the Mississippi by cotton farmers. California's drought is a complex and incredibly important issue, and both it and the incredible growth and prosperity the state has seen over the last century until now are intrinsically linked to these two marvels of engineering, which brought water hundreds of miles across the state. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you learned something new. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover the countries, cities, people, and places of the world and beyond. These videos will leave you saying, that is interesting.